All right. Good morning. Welcome to uh, the building that belongs to Mercy Village Church. We say that very intentionally because uh, the church is a people. Now, the Bible does refer to us as a building, right? Like we, we, the people, are living stones being built together into a dwelling place for our Lord, which is like pretty mystical. But in that sense, the church is a building, but it's not brick and mortar. It's not this room right here, but this is where we gather, and we're thankful that you're with us here this morning. We have a vision for who we want to be as a people, and it's actually summed up on that sign right over there to my right to your left. It says, we are saved by Jesus to walk with Jesus. So that's our identity, saved by Jesus. That's our intimacy with God. We walk with Jesus together. That's community and worship towards our neighbor, neighbor love. Uh, to the ends of the earth, throughout generations, for all our days. That's who we hope to be as a church. We have a few announcements. The vast majority of the details you can see on the back of this half sheet of paper you should have received on the way in, and if you didn't, they're on the Connect desk on your way out of here. The only one I want to really highlight today, the rest of them you can look at on your own, is our Give Love Village Food Box Fill-Up. We are delivering those... Good save. We are delivering those next week. So after church service next week, we will take those boxes. We right now have about 60. That list is growing to maybe we're going to shoot for about 70, 75 boxes by next week. What we need right now are two things. We need more stuff to put in them, in particular hams and pies. I will be here all week, every day this week, from 11.30 to 1.30. So if you like have your lunch hour and you want to drop any food supplies by, I'll be here at the building every day this week from 11.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. We need hams, fully cooked hams for these boxes. we got a giant refrigerator in there that we can store them in. Just make sure the expiration date is far enough out, but we'll take those. We need pies, and then we still need things like stuffing, instant potatoes, and macaroni and cheese. So that's number one. The number one way you can be involved is to give more to fill up these boxes. If you have a connection to any local businesses or any uh, people that might want to donate to this cause, let me know. We have a corporate donation letter that I can put in your hand, and you can hand to anybody that you know who might be willing to, to donate to this cause as well. The second thing we need are people next week to stick around afterwards. Uh, We're going to try to prepackage the boxes, except for the hams and the pies. We'll load those into the boxes next week. And then if you're able to, there's a sign-up sheet in the Connect Desk in the back, in the lobby. If you're able to deliver two, three, four boxes, then we just want to know kind of where you live or what area of town you travel to Uh, because we've got them as far away as the west end of Huntington and across the river, and then you can just go. They know they're coming. They know the boxes are coming. You can just drop them off at people's houses. So that's a lot, but it's pretty simple. We need more food, and we need people to deliver boxes. You can sign up to deliver on the Connect Desk in the back. There's also a sign-up sheet if you know anybody that that needs a box during the Christmas season. So if you have any questions about that, need me to clarify anything, you can talk to me, talk to Jeremiah, uh, but we would love to see you participate in that. Now what we're going to do, and we do this about every four or five weeks, is we're just going to kind of get quiet for about 30 seconds. And, And I say this, like that feels like an eternity, but I don't want us to waste it. I want us to kind of, in that moment, as we prepare to pray and start this gathering together, It's just a time for you to kind of let go of anything that's distracting you, prepare our hearts to receive what it is that God has for us today. So the kids probably won't be silent. That's fine. Mine will, right? I'm kidding. (laughs) It's always good. It's good for their psychology to threaten them from the stage is what somebody told me. I, I might need a new, I might need a new therapist. I don't know, but we're going to be silent. See what God has for us today for about 30 seconds and then I'll, I'll pray.
Father, whether we are acutely aware of it, slightly aware of it, or not aware of it at all, we desperately need you today. There are things we have going on in this life, whether we're dealing with things that are in front of us that seem insurmountable, or there's things behind us that we that are so painful, it seems like they will always be with us in a way that is seemingly unbearable. Whether it's this very morning or this very week, we all have things in this life that whether we believe it or not, we will struggle to deal with. Some of us are very acutely aware of that. Others may not be. And what we need the most is your felt presence today with us your truth from the Bible, the truth about Jesus. We need you to renew us, to refresh us, to strengthen us for what it is that we have behind us and before us. So will you do that in this place through the singing of songs, through the preaching of the Bible, through the celebration of communion, through these just very basic practices Will you remind us of who you are and who we are because of Jesus? It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome, Mercy Village Church. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here. Will you stand with us, with me? <clears throat> if you're new with us, we begin our gathering by singing songs together, proclaiming truth to one another of what Jesus has done for us. And uh, so we lift our voices and sing uh, together out of gladness of heart. Uh, this is the Christmas season, and so we're singing uh, Christmas songs together. Um, let's do that together. While shepherds kept their watching, over silent flocks by night Behold throughout the heavens There shone a holy light And the shepherds feared and trembled And to above the earth Rang out the angel chorus Hail the Savior's birth. Come on, church. And go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Down in a lonely manger. The humble Christ was born And God sent us salvation That blessed Christmas morn And go tell it on the mountain Over the hills, everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born and go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. And he made me a watchman upon the city wall. And if I am a Christian, I am the least of all. I am the least of all. And go tell it on the mountain, over the hills, everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, that Jesus Christ is born. And go tell it on the mountain, over the hills, everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, and that Jesus Christ is born. believe that.
that today. Amen. Let's continue singing this Christmas carol together. Psalm 51 says, Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in the sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. If you're in Christ today, you've been given his righteousness. He's taken your sin upon him at the cross. 
and you are free from sin today. And it all started in Bethlehem. Let's sing this next one together. that one again. Father, thank you today for that truth. You sent Jesus into this world to save us. He lived the perfect life that we could not live. He died on a cross for our sins. And we're here today because of him. 
God, show us truth. Reveal to us more of who you are today. Help our unbelief, God. Draw us close to you as your children today. Save those among us who may not know what we're talking about. God, reveal to them the truth that Jesus is the only way to heaven. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Kids are dismissed. All right. I'm going to read a portion of our passage for today. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to read verses 20 through 24. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all uh, shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom of God, the, uh, the kingdom of God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. And we say together, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Hark the herald angels sing. That's uh, the, what we've been doing in this series is taking themes from different Christmas hymns, Christmas carols, and kind of springboarding off of those themes to be reminded about what it is that Jesus accomplished in his coming in his advent with us. Today's hymn is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Now I want to share uh, just the tiniest bit of its story with you. There's a man named Charles Wesley. He had a brother named John Wesley. Uh, If you ever find a hymnal, if you go to a church that has a a hymnal and you open it up to almost any page, you'll, you'll almost certainly be very close, if not right on a page where you'll see the name John Wesley prolific hymn writer. His brother Charles wrote many of those hymns with him. Charles, however, went solo on this album and wrote Hark the Herald Angels Sing himself. And at first, it had five stanzas. So there were five stanzas to this hymn. Do we See, there you go. So if you find the right old hymnal, this is actually it with four stanzas. We're, we're, uh, we'll get to that part of the story here. What happened is he wrote the song, in, let me get the date right, 1739. So it's an old hymn. So he wrote it in 1739. It's about 40 years before the independence of the United States. It's an old hymn. And he had a friend named George Whitfield. Now, I don't know if you've heard that name, but he was a famous evangelist in that day. I mean, like, super effective preacher. So George Whitfield commandeered the song and kind of rewrote a few of the lyrics, and he actually brought it down to four stanzas, as you'll see it in this. This is an old hymn book just for regular church use. But what happened with the song, the reason we sing it with three stanzas, is because in the late 1700s there was a hymnal. Again, there's no internet. There, you know, like you couldn't just go search up the lyrics for a song, right? So hymnals were like the, the way that churches got the hymns that they were singing, and there was a, a hymnal released, Carols for Choirs, and it was Christmas songs. And in that were only those first three stanzas of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. So there's some forgotten verses to that hymn, if, uh, if, and we're going to actually hear one of them today. George Whitfield wrote it with four stanzas, and we're going to look at that fourth stanza today, that forgotten stanza of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. It reads like this, Come desire of nations come, fix in us thy humble home, rise the woman's conquering seed, bruise in us the serpent's head, Adam's likeness now efface, stamp thine image in its place, final Adam from above reinstate us in thy love. I love it. I love it in particular because it highlights two of my very favorite themes of Advent. One is the arrival of what my kids call the snake crusher, the one who would bruise the serpent's head from the promise there in the Garden of Eden. And the other is the theme of a better 
final and second Adam. In week one, we looked at that theme of uh, the snake crusher, the one who would come, that was promised in Genesis, who would come and crush the head of the the serpent who deceived Adam and Eve in the, the garden. This week, we're going to look at that theme of the final Adam, or the second Adam, who uh, comes to earth in the form of a baby child that we celebrate at Christmas time. But we're going to look at a passage where Paul cites this theme of a, of a second Adam in a way that helps us look both at the first advent of Jesus, but also at the second advent. Jesus is coming again, and 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 15, is all about that. We just read verse 22. You can see in verse 22 that theme lived out again. I'm out of order on the slides, I'm sorry. But verse 22 says, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all die be made alive. As in Adam, the first Adam, all die. In Christ, the final Adam, the second Adam, all are made alive. What we're going to see today is that if Jesus, the final Adam, isn't raised from the dead, if there's no resurrection for Jesus, then Christmas is absolutely worthless. If Jesus doesn't raise from the dead, then Christmas is absolutely worthless. Now, we've got a lot of traditions that we've formed over the time, and they might still have some value and still be fun. So I'm not saying that you wouldn't have any fun on Christmas Day. I'm just saying from a spiritual perspective, from a biblical perspective, from what the holiday is really all about perspective, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, it'd be, be absolutely worthless. We go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 because uh, Paul invokes the theme here in such a way that, like I said, it points to our, the first advent of Jesus, his first coming, his first arrival, while also pointing it towards his second coming. There will be another advent. Jesus is coming again. He more famously, I think, this, uh, cites this same theme of a second Adam in Romans. In fact, a, a lot of people go here for the, this idea, to flesh out this idea that Jesus is known as the second Adam, if you were at verse 12 in Romans chapter 5, you would read, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all have sinned. And Paul will, in that passage, develop out this theme, that Adam's sin brought a curse. First, the, the, the first Adam, Jesus, the second Adam, brings life. Father, today, what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Paul starts, at least the passage we'll read today, with a heartbreaking hypothetical. And I'm just going to read it so you can sigh a sigh of relief, verses 12 through 19. Now, I say that, I may have a couple sentences but, that I say about it, but it'll mainly just be reading. So, we really only have to preach through about four verses, so you can rest easy. But I do want to read these first seven verses because it, it sets the tone for what's to come in verses 20 through 24. Paul writes, starting in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead... How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? The short version is there were people in Corinth saying there was no resurrection from the dead. And he is reprimanding them. He's he's confronting them. Because he says if there's no resurrection from the dead, verse 13, then not even Christ has been raised. Be careful what your worldview leaves room for and doesn't. And if Christ has not been raised, verse 14, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Without the resurrection, not only is Christmas worthless, your faith is worthless. This whole Christian practice, you should have slept in this morning, right? If Jesus isn't risen from the dead, you should have slept in this morning. How, you know, right? Like there's no point in what we're doing if, if Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead. Verse 15, we're even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. He's... he's being a little repetitive here, but you get the point. 
And if Christ has not been raised, verse 17, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. You're not free from sin if Jesus isn't raised. Verse 18, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. That's a heartbreaking hypothetical. Some of y'all are looking to being reunited with loved ones who have gone before you because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross who was raised from the dead. And verse 18 says, hypothetically speaking, if Jesus wasn't raised, then that hope, there's no hope. You'll never see them again. It's over. Verse 19, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. That's a heartbreaking hypothetical. That if Jesus isn't raised, then we're wasting our time and there is no hope and there is no freedom from sin. But it's a hypothetical that at least finds its felt understanding in the first Adam. You trace his painful story, you see in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, then God said to himself, he, he's in Trinity from the... From, from before time even began. So he, he said, let us, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, make man in our image after our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In his image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, He created him. This is what he tells Adam to do. So he makes him perfect. He puts him in a perfect place and he gives him a job. God blessed him and God said to to him, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And you skip down to verse 31. It says, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and there was evening and there was morning on the sixth day. Now, if you follow what's happened so far as the first Adam, he's got an okay situation. He's been placed perfect in a place that is perfect. And he's been given a job by God. Take my perfection, God says, and multiply it out over this whole earth. Bring my perfection to bear everywhere. Bring my beauty to bear everywhere. Bring my glory to bear everywhere. That's his job. (laughs) You know how the story goes, though. Uh, I mean, if you fast forward then to chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, we see him again. This is the, the crucial one rule that God gave him. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day that you eat of it you shall surely die. That's another clue that you have to pick up here, that death comes with sin. Before sin, no death. Right? So what Adam is supposed to do is to live forever in perfection, in the presence of God's perfection, multiplying God's perfection out across the entire world. Chapter 3 is heartbreaking. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? He's twisting God's words, by the way. He's good at that. He's going to kind of try to justify things. The woman said to him, she knows scripture, she knows what God's words, said to him, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, You just made it sound like we can't eat of any of the trees in the garden. That's not what God said. God said we can eat from all of them. But there's one tree, he said, you shall not eat the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, and he's been saying things like this ever since, you shall not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. How nice would that be if we could be in control of this whole darn thing? Didn't have to submit ourselves to a higher power. Uh, Right, like we could just do our thing when we want to, how we want to, no consequences. Free from the sovereign power of God. That's what Satan promises. You can make your own choices. You're worth it, right? Just do it. Maybe it's Maybelline, right? Or whatever, you know, like like the, the, the... My point, the lie still echoes throughout the world. 
You don't need God. Figure this thing out on your own. And they bought it. Hook, line, and sinker, man. They ate the fruit. And if you fast forward to the end of the curse that God spells out in chapter 3, you read in verse 19, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You ever heard this at a funeral? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Wasn't supposed to be that way. But because of sin, for you are dust. And to dust you shall return. Adam, the first Adam, was supposed to multiply perfection through the world. Multiply glory throughout the world. That was the gift he was supposed to give to the world, but instead he gave us sin and death. And that's our big brother, Adam. By one man, Paul says in Romans, sin comes into the world and Death by sin and death passes upon all, for all have sinned. What we said week one of this Advent series is that the rest of the Old Testament, over half of the pages in this book, are are a story of, of people waiting for another Adam. Waiting for the second Adam to arrive and to and to fix everything that the first Adam messed up. It's a story of people waiting for Christmas. Christmas comes. Luke chapter 2, that famous passage, right? Like we know that story. Jesus, Adam number 2, lives as God in the flesh. Jesus, the snake crusher, dies in the place of ruined sinners for our redemption. He crushes the power of Satan and sin and makes it possible for us to be made right with God, or as the hymn says it in that lost fourth stanza, be reinstated by His love. To be reinstated into a relationship with God. This is the Gospel. This is the message of salvation that because of Adam, we're all out of luck and there ain't nothing we can do about it. We are separated from eternal intimacy with God, but God so loved the world, that famous verse, that He gave His only Son, That whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. That the finished work of Jesus on the cross is enough. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But what Paul says and what he's getting at in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is that if there's no resurrection, this is worthless. None of this matters. Verse 19 again, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Without Easter, Christmas is worthless. Put all the Christmas decorations away, right? Put the Advent wreaths away. No parties. Just sin and death. How depressing. Heartbreaking. Hypothetical. Verse 20. But. (laughs) I always joke around how I like buts. I love buts. My point, though, is truly a a hermeneutical one. How's that for a fancy word? When you study the Scriptures, learn to love contrast words. They matter. They come in the right places because God is gracious. And this one comes in the right place because God is filled with grace. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Verses 12-19 through are a heartbreaking hypothetical, but... Verse 20 is a glorious reality. Jesus has been raised from the dead. Think about this too in this Advent season. As Jesus is conceived by God in the Virgin Mary, He is in a dark womb. Right? The dark womb of her belly. And I mean literally. It's literally dark. I don't know if you've been in a womb before, but it's pretty dark in there. Um, Get it? It is. You probably don't remember. Thanks, Chelsea. I appreciate that. But it's dark in there. And then, right on Christmas Day, He's birthed out into the light, into the world. Same thing happens with the resurrection. He's buried in the dark womb of the earth. Three days later, gloriously pushed out into light. Jesus is born into light 
and he dies, and he's born again through the resurrection. The light. See, Adam didn't have that story. Adam sinned, died, was buried in the womb of the earth, and he stayed there. His bones rotted away. Jesus is raised. It's a life that's good news for us today, which brings us back to the final Adam. Verse 21 and 22. For as by a man came death, Adam, thanks Adam, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. Now, what we're looking to, what Paul is pointing us to, is the reality that Jesus' resurrection is your resurrection if you're a child of God. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the first advent, Jesus's, is the seal of your resurrection at the second advent. Advent means coming. Jesus came, lived, died, was buried, raised from the dead. Resurrection in the first advent. Jesus is coming again, and when He does, there will be resurrection in the second advent. This time it will be yours, if you're a child of God. You live forever in the presence of God. That's what the Bible proclaims. And Christmas is a time where we can remember that. Paul kind of wraps up his thought in verses 23 and 24. It says, But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. It's not really that complex. It's just kind of written in a way that's maybe lofty, but he just means Jesus was the first one to experience resurrection. You'll be the second. Jesus had his at the first advent. You'll have yours at the second. Verse 24, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God the Father over, destroying every rule and every authority and power. Second Advent. Christmas and Easter are inseparably linked. So when we talk about, when you see that theme, and it's in some, it's in other Christmas carols as well, of a second Advent, or you see of a, of a final Adam, when you see that terminology thrown around, it has a deep, theological, cut through the entire trajectory of Scripture, meaning to it. And it's a personal meaning. You have hope beyond the grave. And this has changed the very essence of who we are as Christians. If you skip to verse 49 of that same chapter, you read this. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, the one who turned back into dust, we, were hit, we bore His image. He's, a, he's our big brother, Adam, the sinner who made us sinners. We shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. That line, that poetic line that says, Adam's likeness now a face, stamp thine image in its place, that's where it comes from. You aren't going to look like Adam, the first Adam forever. God, even now, if you're a Christian, is making you look more and more like Jesus. And one day at the second advent, He's going to make you look just like Jesus. It's coming. The image of Adam replaced with the image of Jesus. Beautiful. Which means, this is my favorite one as we close. Paul can say in Romans chapter 16, verse 20, (laughs) the God of peace will soon crush Satan under whose feet? Your feet. You know you get to be a snake crusher too? Because of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I know that sounds like a fairy tale. But hear me today. Not only are you not going to die, you're a child of God. But in the second advent, you're going to dance on the devil's head. That's true, right? It's as true as the seat you're sitting in. I know it doesn't sound that way. I know that's really hard to wrap your brain around and believe, but it's true. You're going to live forever and you're going to be victorious over Satan and sin 
and all of those things. So Paul finishes that chapter when just in glory. He says, one day in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. You'll be invincible and we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of sin, or the sting of death is sin. Thanks to Adam, the first one. But the power of sin is the law, thanks to the second Adam. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a season of magic and wonder. It's all over the place, right? This Christmas is magical season. Why not go all in to the supernatural and believe today with all your heart that you're going to live forever, you're going to be victorious over sin, you're going to reign with Jesus. Let it, let that be what you believe in the depths of your heart. Almost makes you want to sing it again, right? With the fourth stanza. Come, desire of nations, come. Fix in us thy humble home. Rise the woman's conquering seed. Bruise in us the serpent's head. Adam's likeness now a face. Stamp thine image in its place. Final Adam from above. Reinstate us in thy love. Hark, the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. How do we respond? Here's one application, but it starts with a consideration. This season is so programmed to celebrate, and it's everywhere and it's beautiful, that first part of Jesus' advent. The shepherds and their obedience and their worship. Mary's deep faith. I mean, even somewhat reckless and beautiful faith and belief in in God's promise and her deep humility. Joseph's humility and uh, faithfulness, the wise men come, like all that stuff. We see those parts of the story everywhere around us during this season, and they're worthy of our deep consideration and and full consideration. But do not forget the reality that Jesus' first advent was 30 plus years long, and it included as well His death, his burial, his resurrection. It included him getting close to the broken and the sick and the lame. It included him healing people and raising the dead. Right? Like it included all of these things. When, when we celebrate a birthday, in particular if it's, it's for one of our children, we don't just remember that one day that they were born. We tend to, if you're anything like me, to remember right time passing by and all that, that has happened in their lives. We celebrate Jesus' birthday, right? Let's remember all of His life this season. Additionally, if you are a child of God, you live between two resurrections. The first was Jesus's, and the second will be yours. So here's the question. And if I could make us all think deeply about this question. I would, but I can't. But I'm trusting that the Holy Spirit will, like, in some way, take this question and help you to practically, personally think about this. What would change in your life right now? What would change in your life right now if you had full faith? Full faith. Like, with your whole heart in Jesus' first Advent resurrection, and in your second Advent resurrection. If you believed with your whole heart, every fiber of your being, that Jesus is invincible, and that you too, because of Him, are invincible, what would change in your life? What would change in the the way that you uh, spend your time? What would change in your boldness maybe to share your faith? What would change in the way you prioritize your week? What fears would fall away? What grief would you be met by these realities in? What would it do about the way you spend your money or the the way you value worship with the people of God? And on and on the list could go if we really wholeheartedly 
believe this. And if this sounds like scolding, I apologize. You have to trust my heart. And I want you to. That what I'm really doing is inviting me, myself included, into true, unadulterated freedom. Real freedom. The freedom of following an invincible Jesus as people who share in that same invincibility. What would change in your life today? That's what living between the two advents paves the way for, is for us to be people who are courageous and selfless and healthy and holistic and non-anxious and generous healthy, persevering, renewed. The list could go on of all the abundant realities that can be yours by living between those two advents with your whole heart. If Jesus, the final Adam, isn't raised from the dead, Christmas is absolutely worthless. But He has been raised. And that makes Christmas an annual battle cry of victory and a foretaste of of the second advent, might this profoundly and beautifully change us in the depths of our souls. Father, thank You so much. You sent Jesus and that He's coming back again. Thank You that through Jesus' death on the cross, we are spiritually set free from the death of, of sin. And thank You that through Jesus' physical, real life, resurrection, we are set free from the physical realities of death. Give us worship as we look back at the first advent. Give us hope as we look towards the second advent and profoundly change our lives. That we would be people who live in the reality of resurrection. Your son, Jesus' resurrection and our resurrection. Might that change us as fathers and mothers and husbands and wives and children and brothers and sisters and neighbors and all the roles that we play, employees, all the things. And it profoundly transform who we are. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. That question will be up on the screen. What we've gotten a habit of doing is just taking a few moments to be silent. To, if God's speaking to you in any specific ways, this is a moment for you to just listen to His voice. It really is in this time. And then we'll celebrate communion together. We'll move into a time of communion here together. Today we're reading from Matthew 26. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and offered blessing. He blessed it and broke it and gave it to them, the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. And I tell you, I will not eat or drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. If you're new with us, we pass the communion out on either side. Take a moment, and then we will actually partake of this meal together as family. Uh, the symbol of Christ's body that was broken for us is a cracker, and the juice is a symbol of Christ's blood that was shed for us. And we do that today. If you're not a believer, just watch and observe the body of Christ as we take this meal together, or believe in Jesus today and take this meal with us. We take this as a symbol of Christ's body that was broken for us. This is a symbol of Christ's blood that was shed for us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you today for forgiveness of sin. Thank you that we can come before you today. The scripture says your mercies are new every day. We thank you for that. Thank you that that you have not left us to do life on our own, but you are with us. You've gone before us even. You know the days that we have, God. And so I just pray that as we uh, leave this place today, 
that we'll leave with boldness, that we'll go and tell it on the mountain, as the song says, but God, that we'll have boldness to share our faith, to share the truth of who Jesus is as we know you, God, but most importantly, that you know us. I thank you for this body of believers that you're gathering together here in the village of Barbersville. God, unite us as a church that our foundation will be you and always you, only you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to dismiss with what we call the Mercy Village Church mantra. It reminds us of the realities of the gospel. Before I do, I just want to remind you of the food box fill up. If you can participate in any way, uh, please, uh, all the info is on social media as well. But if you can bring a ham or pie or anything this week, I'll be here from 11.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. every day this week to collect that stuff, and then Saturday morning as well from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. So anyway, and then next Sunday, collect them next Sunday as well. So, My sin runs deep, God's grace runs deeper still, in Christ alone, anyone can get in on this. You're dismissed.